Okay, um, we're moving on to the second PowerPoint within this unit, though. Uh, this unit's probably called like Foundations of Democracy or something. Does that sound right, Brian? Founding America. Founding America. Founding America. Oh, that is. Yeah. I'm saying Foundations is definitely in there. Miss Bay, you don't even know what the unit's called. Founding of America. I rewrite my. I'm so like. I'm such a crazy person. Me it's too, just terrible. Baker. Like I make life harder for myself, and I like hey, rewrite my bed? class all the time. I am, yes. Like, I'm in my own home now. I'm no longer in this What? Not here. Are you in your own bed, though? Yes. Yes, believe me. Like, the very first thing that I did was put my bed together. And my children's bed. Okay, we're going to back up. I don't know. I A couple of the classes never got through Adams. And uh, so we're going to back up. We're going to cover Adams real quickly. And then we're going to move on to Thomas Jefferson, uh, who is who is... Well, I mean, let's just be honest. Thomas Jefferson is one of probably seven presidents you absolutely would have to learn in a U.S. history class. Okay? Um, so, Adams, we've already talked about who he was. He was very intellectual, right? We talked about the fact that he was an attorney. Um, he defended Preston Brooks's men during the Boston Massacre, uh, helped get John Hancock off on, like, a technicality, right? Um, was a delegate to the Continental Congress, was an ambassador, um, was the first vice president. And again, um, the things that ultimately really, really um, derail, the, the things that derail his presidency more than anything else, right? Um, the XYZ affair is uh, an issue between uh, the French and uh, uh, the the newfound United States, right? Uh, the question becomes whether or not the United States is really a, a like an actual country. Does that make sense? Okay. You'll all right. Do you understand what makes a country? Uh, a continent, a country? No, 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 no. Like, is uh, uh what is it? Taiwan? Let's go with Taiwan. Is Taiwan a country? Okay, so what would make Taiwan a country then? How do we how do we know how to answer the question? Okay, excellent. Recognition. Who has to recognize? It's opinion based. Other countries. Other countries. No, it's, it's not opinion based. Right? Like, I need you to really, like, you, we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail next year in government when we actually talk about, like, Taiwan and, like, countries like that. But Palestine is another example, right? Is Palestine an actual nation? Okay? The issue becomes, really, you are not a country unless you are received and recognized on an international stage as an equal, right? So, the United States, this brand new country, we sent some people to France because you have to have, like, normalized relations. You have to have relations with other countries. Right? You've got to talk to other countries from time to time. You cannot be 100% isolated, even though that's going to be our foreign policy for the next, like, 150 years, for the most part. Right? Are the French willing to meet with us? They were not without a bribe. They wanted money, right? Which is what this comes down to, right? They basically wanted money in order to recognize the United States. And, and listen to me, if you've got to pay... If you've got to pay to play, you're not a potato. You understand what that means? If you have to pay, right, in order to like meet a an equal, y'all are not equal. Right? So if we had to give bribes to the French, if we had to pay the French in order to have like diplomatic meetings with them, then the French are not treating us as an equal. We are beneath them. That's a big problem. All right. The Alien and Sedition Acts are ultimately what is really going to derail the Adams presidency. And again, this should be a little bit of review from what we covered at the end of last week if this class was able to get through it. I don't remember if they were or not. Right? Um, the alien, so we know what aliens are, yes? I'm not talking about like ET and Area 51. Yeah. Right? Alien just means like, yeah, for a foreign born individual. Right? You have resident aliens, you have legal aliens, you have all kinds of different statuses that exist. All right, but really what we're just talking about is anybody that is not a naturalized uh, citizen, 
right? They are not either naturally born or have gone through the process of naturalization in order to become an American citizen, all right? Um, so the Alien Friends Act basically allows for the deportation of people that are dangerous to the peace and the safety and the well-being of the United States, right? You understand the United States is allowed to deport people that are not American citizens back to their homeland, yes? Okay, that still exists to this day. And, and in fact, we have a presidential election coming up here in 15 days that is on some level like right, right, dealing with this. Yes, so am I, son. So am I. Why are you're like 14? Why are you getting text messages well, about I voting? Too. I don't. <sighs> okay, I'm sadly I'm actually not surprised. But let's let's continue with, with this. Right? They want me. Next, listen to me. Next, if you want to stay in the United States, right? If you are an alien, you want to stay in the United States, you have to become naturalized. Right? And I need you to realize the naturalization process in the United States is a complex, difficult, time-consuming, time consuming, expensive endeavor. Right? Washington, sorry, not Washington, Adams is going to make it even harder to become naturalized. Okay? I need you to understand that this is 100% political. Yes? 100% political, right? The immigrants coming into the United States, they would, by all accounts, support the Democratic Republicans. The Federalists are in power. The fewer people that they can allow to vote, the more people that they can keep out of the election process, the higher the likelihood of them winning. We understand that? Okay, that is significant. Okay. Right. So, if you can control the number of people that are voting or who is voting, it's going to benefit you in an election. We understand that, right? Or that's what Adams is trying to do. The Sedition Act, right? Sedition is simply speaking out against the government. Are you allowed to speak out against the government? Okay, listen, listen to me, guys. If speaking poorly about the United States government were an actual crime, I would be in prison for the rest of my life. Ah, shit. No, like, you should. Just, just so we're crystal clear, you should speak poorly of your government. Because your government, you should always expect higher or better for your government. Right? Okay? Have, you should have high expectations for everything. Right? That's just a general truth in life. Okay? If government is not benefiting you, you ought to say something. And, and in this day and age, government does not exist to benefit you. So you ought to be saying a lot of things nowadays because government exists to benefit government anymore. Right? This brings us to the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, and this is going to become something that we're going to start seeing as we move forward, right? Under the Articles of Confederation, because again, we're going to compare the Articles of Confederation and our newfound Constitution. If the state of Virginia didn't like a law passed under the legislative body of the Articles of Confederation, what did the state of Virginia do? They don't have veto authority, right? But what else could you do? And how many of you love how many of you love the speed limit here in Fulcher? Right? You think it's perfect. I don't follow it. Follow okay, so if you don't like the law, hey, if you don't like the law, what do you do? Break it. Break it. <laughs> yes? Okay. You chew. So listen, guys, under the Articles of Confederation, you understand this. Under the Articles of Confederation, various states just simply said, we're not gonna do that. We're not following that law. Right? Now we know in the Articles of Confederation did the national government, did that legislative body, have any authority, any power to make the state in Okay. So we should recognize then that under the Constitution we corrected that issue, yes? Alright, this is where we find ourselves now with some of these behaviors during the Adams administration, right? We the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, which are essentially nullification acts. Right? Nullification is a word you need to know. If you nullify something, what does that mean? You 
you cancel it, you take it away, right? So the United States Congress passed the law and Virginia goes, eh, I'm not gonna follow that. We're gonna nullify that law. That law doesn't exist in the state of Virginia, right? Can they do that? This is going to become, well, here's the thing, and I, you know, eventually you'll understand this, right? And this is, again, probably more for government next year than it is for, for us right now, right? Everything is legal until you're told otherwise. Yes? Do we get that concept? So, could a state nullify a national law? Absolutely, until the Supreme Court comes back and says you can't do that. Right? If nobody says you can't do it, you can do it. Don't tell your parents I said that. They'd be mad at you. All right. So this brings us to the election of 1800. The election of 1800 is really actually significantly important for American history, right? Because I told you uh, last week, right, uh, George Washington is really sort of a member of what political party? He's kind of a Federalist, right? Does Washington run for re-election in 1796? No. Right, Washington's out, he quit, he's going home. So in 1796, 1796, we have Adams versus Jefferson, right? And Adams wins, Adams takes the White House. Now in 1800, we have the exact same result, right? The same uh, process playing out, and Thomas Jefferson is going to win, okay? What that means is, is John Adams was seeking re-election. He wanted to stay as president of the United States. And this is really, really important to a democracy because in a functioning democracy, you must have, must have the peaceful transition of power, okay? What that means is, is that when the people have spoken, and they have elected new leadership, the old leadership must respect that and walk away peacefully, okay? And I need you to realize, because you understand that this has like connotations for today, yes? You understand what I'm saying? Like there are people that think we don't have very peaceful transitions of power today, okay? I need you to realize that this is not solely because of how partisan we are today. You know what that word means, partisan? Relating to the parties, right? If the Democrats over here and the Republicans over here and they hate each other anymore, yes? They cannot agree on anything, right? This is where people think, oh, if, you know, if Donald Trump wins, he will never give up power. Right? We, would, we would cease to have the peaceful transition of power. I need you to understand that Adams and Jefferson is really not that different than Biden-Trump, okay? In the political aspect, right? In the political arena, meaning that these two people really don't like each other ideologically. They do not agree ideologically, right? They're adamantly opposed to one another. They have very different visions for the future of the United States and what the government ought to be doing and all of that, that, that all of it that entails, okay? But Adams loses and walks away peacefully for the most part, right? We'll get to the one sort of shady thing Adams does right before he leaves. All right, so, and um, what you have, you have a highly contested and disputed election. Again, I think I told you, um, maybe when we were covering the Constitution, yes, that, that when you vote, when originally, originally, when you vote, when the Electoral College votes for President of the United States, they vote twice, yes? Mm -hmm. Right, and then whoever has the most votes is President, and the second most votes is Vice President, yeah? And in 1800, we have a tie for the most votes. Right? Between Thomas Jefferson and a guy named Aaron Burr. Right? Anybody know what happens to presidential elections when we don't know who won? No. Because if you re it with the Electoral College, there's only 538 members of the Electoral College. The odds of them changing their mind will be relatively split. Right? It's not like you're changing the minds of, of millions of people where small swings would make a significant difference. Never endorsements? Nope. 
it goes to the House of Representatives. Okay? In fact, our founding fathers actually believed that this is what would happen relatively frequently. They actually thought the House of Representatives would choose the President of the United States with some frequency. Right? Has the House of Representatives ever chosen the President of the United States? The answer is yes. They did it in 1800, they did it in 1824, they did it in 1876. That might be it. No. No, it hasn't happened recently because we live in we live in a two-party state, which lends itself to majorities, right? When this happens, you have no majority. So like it's next unit, maybe the end of this unit. I don't know when we're gonna cover 1824. I don't really care that much about 1824. In 1824, you have four people running. None of them get a majority of the vote because there's four candidates, right? Our elections today only have two candidates, right? I, I'm sorry, but Jill Stein and Chase Oliver are not real candidates. They will get zero electoral college votes. Yes, ma'am. So, like, is it possible that we would have tied? Like, technically, possible? Uh, technically, yes. Uh, in interestingly enough, when you get to government, I'll show you on a map. With relative ease, I can make it 269 to 269. Right? With relative ease. Especially if Donald Trump gets what he wants. Right? Uh, there's actually a fairly decent chance that Kamala Harris wins 270 to 268. Okay? Which would obviously be the closest election ever. Right? Um, but it goes to the House of Representatives. Okay? In the House of Representatives, when the House of Representatives decides a presidential election, every state gets one vote. Period. Okay? The House of Representatives is actually controlled or dominated by the Federalists. Okay? They win the presidential election. So what do they do? The Federalists ultimately get to decide which Democratic Republican is President of the United States. They pick Thomas Jefferson over Aaron Burr. Federalists control Congress. They control the House of Representatives. Yeah. Okay? And so when we have a tie, when we don't have a winner in the Electoral College, it goes to the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is controlled by the Federalists. Yeah. But the Federalists have to pick basically amongst the two people that tie. But I thought, I'm not talking about the Adams versus Jefferson election. We are. But the top two vote getters are Jefferson and Aaron Burr. Oh, oh. Okay? Because here's the thing Burr is tied to Jefferson. Okay? It's not like it is today. Again, the 11th and 12th Amendments change the functionality of this. Okay? And we changed the functionality of this because it just it didn't work, right? Because essentially Jefferson and Burr ran together, but we didn't know which was president and which was vice president. Now, like, Harris is president, Walls is VP. Trump is president, Vance is VP. We know this because they run together and we only vote one time. And we used to vote twice. That's why they each have the exact same number of votes. Okay? But because it was a tie, it has to go to the House of Representatives. The Federalist Party controls that and they get to decide. They pick Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson is then going to usher in of what I refer to as, as Jeffersonian democracy, right? Uh, and this is going to be, uh, in fact, Jefferson claims to be a president of the people. He claims to be a common man, right? Now, we'll see whether or not that's actually true, okay? Um, that is a, a claim that a number of presidents will make over the course uh, of time, right? Uh, in which case, Sometimes that's successful, sometimes it's not, okay? But Jefferson's ultimately gonna make that claim, all right? Um, the Federalists, we have already talked about, were sort of the elitists. And so Jefferson's election does begin to uh, create a sense of non, um, sort of oligarchical rule or monarchical rule, right? A non uh, elitist concept. And okay? that being said, when Jefferson takes office, he does push the ideal that we are all Federalists and we are all Democratic Republicans, right? 
That means that this national government, this federal government, has to represent the entirety of the nation. Okay? Again, these are precedents that are being set for future generations. We understand that? Okay? Joe Biden took office. He said, I am president for Republicans and Democrats alike. All right? Okay? So, under this Jeffersonian term, right, under the Jeffersonian system, we're going to try to begin to increase political participation. Because if it is the people's president, right, if we are going to be uh, more democratic and less uh, aristocratic, right, we know what an aristocracy is. Fancy word for elites. Okay. And I need you to realize Jefferson is actually not necessarily opposed to aristocracy as a concept, right? Because that happens in republics. We're not a democracy, we are a republic, right? That means that we elect people and send them to Congress and they vote on our behalf, yes? Do we understand that difference? Because that's probably on the test, right, Ruben? So, if, we, if we're a republic and we send people to Congress for us, that sort of becomes the aristocracy, yes? Under the Federalist model, that aristocracy is sort of economic elites, okay? Economic elites tend to be economic elites generation after generation after generation. Do you understand that? Okay, like Paris Hilton is rich for having done nothing. There are still rich Rockefellers in the United States who have done nothing. Okay? The Kennedy family is rich from their behaviors 100 years ago during Prohibition. All right. Well, generational wealth is inherited and not, not easily lost. All right. What Jefferson wants, though, is an aristocracy of talent. Okay? That means that the common man who is good, intelligent, capable, they can get into Congress and be a part of the Republic and, and, and help rule, right? So in order to do that, we have to get rid of the elitist ideologies. We need to increase political participation. We need to increase the number of people that are capable of voting, right? So when you look at like 1787, when we first started this process, who was allowed to vote? Property only white men that were also Property, no, nope. Christianity was not a requirement. That would be a violation of the freedom of, uh, of religion clause, right? So just uh, landowning white men? Of what age? Above 18? I mean, Above 21. 21, 21. Right? So landowning 21-year-old white males, okay? Some places actually stipulated the amount of land you had to own, right? Meaning you could not just own, like, one acre and then, ha-ha, I get to vote. Right, you have to be con contributing more. All right. So what we do is we, some states reduce or, or in some cases we go ahead and eliminate the property requirements for voters. Right. Now all white males, 21 and older, are allowed to vote. Okay. That gives them more opportunity to participate. That is something that the elitist federalists would have been opposed to. Right? Because those people could then theoretically vote themselves into the concept of communism, which doesn't exist yet, and begin to take away the economic advantages of these elites. Right? But this means small farmers, like wage laborers, people that work on a plantation, uh, maybe as an overseer rather than um, own a plantation. Uh, these people are going to become more prominent in the political process because they now have a voice. All right? Um, that being said, right, this is scary to the elites of both sides, all right? The more people that you allow to participate, the more you dilute power. Do you understand that? My vote for president of the United States is one of 170 million, right? Or however many people are gonna show up and vote in a couple weeks, yes? Hey, if I were to eliminate the ability of voting for two-thirds of those people, 
right? You understand that my vote for President of the United States becomes three times stronger, yes? Would I be in favor of that? Yeah. yeah. Right? Because I'm smarter than everybody else. Therefore, my vote should count more. Right? Dumb people shouldn't be allowed to vote. Yes? No, that's not true. There's no like intelligence requirement for being able to vote. And. No, I, 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 I never said that. All right. So, Jefferson is a controversial and contradictory person. Right? Uh, Jefferson claims to hate sneaky politics, but he does a great job of it, right? Um, in fact, because I'm sure some of you have seen like the Hamilton musical, yeah? Um, we know that Hamilton had like an affair, like cheated on his wife, that's one of the things that cost him politically. Jefferson was actually aware of that. Hamilton believed that Jefferson leaked it. I mean, who knows? It's really hard to tell. Um, but, but Jefferson is very, very good He's a good manipulator. He's a good politician, right? I mean, when you talk about what a politician should be and should do and is capable of doing, Jefferson represents that fairly well. Um, that being said, uh, it's not like, it's not the great thing. And Jefferson realizes it's not the greatest thing and doesn't, doesn't anyways, right? Um, Jefferson is actually a fiscal hawk, right? Anybody know what that term means? Okay, so let's actually cover that because you're gonna need to know that it's terms I'm gonna use regularly. Hawk and dove, right? What's a hawk? That's the bird that eats the dove. It's a bird of prey, yes? Right, so it's aggressive, okay? What is a dove? It's like a sign of peace. Peace, yes? Right, so one is aggressive, one is peaceful. Right? Now we'll, we'll typically talk about doves and hawks in, in, in relation to war, right? In which side, like the doves don't want to go to war, the hawks always want to go to war, yes? If I call somebody a fiscal hawk, right? That means that they are adamantly, or they're very aggressive uh, in dealing with governmental spending and, and governmental financial issues, yes? Fiscal hawks predominantly, um, well, no, fiscal hawks period, don't want government to take on excessive debt, right? Governmental debt might be bad, all right? We'll talk about that next year, okay? So Jefferson uh, actually champions like fiscal hawk policies. He doesn't want the government in debt, yet personally, he's massively in debt, right? And again, what he does for himself, not necessarily uh, the same as everybody else. He is the uh, predominant author of the Declaration of Independence, right? Uh, therefore, it's his words, all men are created equal, and yet, he has, he's a slave owner, right? Um, he does not treat his slaves very well, okay? Um, and in fact, ends up having multiple children with Sally Hemings, and that's a portrait rendition of what she was supposed to look like, right? This was one of his slaves. Yeah, there are there are there are people of mixed ancestry today that can like prove that they are a descendant of Thomas Jefferson via like 23 and me or ancestry.com or any of those other terrible websites that you voluntarily give up your DNA to, which you should never ever do. Right? Um it's also important for you to note that Jefferson is um is also contradictory. Uh, in terms of his constitutional philosophies, right? Okay. So obviously the, the Federalists, or excuse me, the Democratic Republicans uh, were, were very harsh on the Federalists for the Alien and Sedition Acts, yes? Right? Which means that Thomas Jefferson is going to come into office and he is going to, like, follow the Constitution to the letter of the law, yes? Nah, he's not. Right? Okay. Interestingly enough, we were literally we wrote the Constitution in 1787, right? And then we violated the Constitution under the Adams administration, and that killed the Federalist Party. The Democratic Republicans take over, and what are we going to do? We're going to violate the Constitution again. Okay. All right. So while he is in office, James Madison is his Secretary of State. I do want you to understand, Secretary of State 
historically, like the foundations of the United States, Secretary of State was essentially next in line to the presidency. Yes? Not the vice president. Okay? Which is a little abnormal today, because today, like if you were the vice president, you're like president in waiting. Yes? Right? I mean, Joe Biden was, was Barack Obama's vice president, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden's vice president, she's running now. Bush, too, was the vice president of Reagan, right? Um, uh, 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 Richard Nixon, right, was actually the vice president of uh, Dwight Eisenhower in the 50s, right? Granted, there's the Kennedy and Johnson administrations in between the two of them, but the vice president, far more prominent today politically than it was. Back then, Secretary of State was the position that you ultimately wanted. Right, that's the position that James Madison is going to get under the Jeffersonian, uh, the Jefferson uh, uh, administration. Okay, um, Jefferson will also uh, play sort of partisan politics when it comes to uh, appointing positions within the government. Right, and I need you to realize if you read the Constitution in depth, uh, the President of the United States is responsible for appointing people to all levels of positions uh, within the United States government. Right. That being said, uh, if the president has the constitutional authority to hire people, does the president of the United States have the constitutional authority to fire people? Yes. Yeah, probably. Does Jefferson utilize that authority? Yes. Absolutely. He fires a whole bunch of Federalists and puts his own cronies into positions of power. You know what a crony is? His like underling, right? His minion, his follower, his person that does his bidding. Sure. All right. Um, now, this brings us back to John Adams. And that, where's your ID, son? You ain't leaving my room without an ID. Right? This brings us back to uh, sort of what Adams does right before Adams leaves office, right? Um, one of the things that you need to realize is that judges hold life appointments. Do you understand what that means? Okay, judges cannot be fired without cause. They can't be impeached, right? That just means that they're put on trial if they've actually like broken the law, right? If a judge gets caught taking bribes, he would be impeached and then he would be removed from the bench, okay? But judges are appointed, they serve for life with good behavior, right? Now, what that means is Whoever is appointing the judges weighs significantly upon the interpretation of law, right? If you pay attention to politics today, this is something that people talk about. Because Donald Trump, just in four short years as president of the United States, Donald Trump appointed three people to the Supreme Court, yes? If you didn't know that, he did. Those three people were all like in their late 40s or early 50s at the time of their appointment. Right? If they serve until 80, they would serve on the court for basically 30 years apiece, right? Uh, again, let's just take, well, let's take 2020 and go out 30 years, right? That's 2050. Is Donald Trump going to be alive in 2050? No. God, no. Right? It's not happening. Okay? So the appointment of judges is wildly important in implementing your policies politically, right? Adams is going to appoint a whole bunch of people to judgeships right before he leaves office. We actually call these the midnight judges, right? So literally, like, Adams is, is his presidency officially ends at midnight of whatever day, yeah? And 1158, that dude is signing his name on documents, being like, you get a job, you get a job, you get a job, you get a job, right? All in the judiciary. So uh, the president can basically like fire the people that, I mean, the judges and then? No, can't fire judges. He can fire bureaucrats, but judges are not bureaucrats, right? The bureaucrats exist in this, the executive branch of the government, right? Uh, the, uh, Joe Biden right now could fire the Secretary of State right this second if he wanted to for no reason whatsoever, right? Joe Biden cannot fire a Supreme Court judge because they exist over here. Um, but like if he were to appoint more judges, isn't there like a limit to the amount of Supreme Court judges? There is no limit. There is no limit. Interestingly enough, there is no limit. 
right? And so we'll see instances in which that might play out where people are like, oh, let me just appoint a whole bunch more. Let me appoint a whole bunch of people, right? And this way I can water it down, right? And even if Jefferson appoints some Democratic Republicans, I've got a whole bunch of Federalists sitting there that will sort of counteract or work against the Democratic Republicans, right? So Adams does this, right? Um, he signs a whole bunch of like, judgeships to people, right? And what does Thomas Jefferson do? Same thing. No. So here's the thing. This is what I need you to understand. John Adams, we call him the Midnight Judges. John Adams is literally signing these papers right before he leaves office, right? This is not like 2024, right? There is no email. He didn't hit send and then it instantaneously went out. What do you have to wait for? Um, the postal service? To wait for a postal carrier. You have to wait for somebody to come pick up those letters that were signed that say, you have a job. So Adams leaves, the letters are sitting there. They're official government documents signed by John Adams. What does Jefferson do? Yeah, I'm just not gonna mail them. If I don't mail them, you don't get a job, right? Okay. Marbury is one of those guys, okay? And so Marbury is actually going to sue. He's going to bring a case to the Supreme Court, right? Uh, challenging the behaviors of uh, Thomas Jefferson and specifically James Madison, his Secretary of State. So this is the guy, right? Um, this is the guy who's actually going to be named in the suit, okay? So this is the Democratic Republicans' attempt attempt to prevent uh, basically a packing of the court system, right, with Federalist judges. So um, why was uh, Madison the main one in the suit if Jefferson was the one that did it? Um, send out the letters. So Madison was obviously a key part of Jefferson's cabinet. Uh, cabinet. My, my guess, I, I've actually never seen any, I've never read anything to specify this. My guess is, um, because you, I don't think you can actually sue the president of the United States. I mean, interestingly enough, if you really pay attention to the law, like if you, if you take like a, a high level government course at some point in time, um, the, the government actually has to consent to being sued, which is a little ridiculous, right? Um, but. It is what it is, right? So that's that's the reason. That's one of the reasons why it would have been Marbury, right? Rather than uh, excuse me, why it would have been Madison rather than than, uh, than him, right? Um, so it goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, the Justice of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice, is a guy named John Marshall, right? Uh, now John Marshall is not the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, right? And I used to have all of the justices up somewhere. I guess I don't. Right. He is not the first. We know that the first is John Jay, yes? Okay, so the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is John Jay. Marshall will take over. He will become the second, or excuse me, not the second, right? But he will be the Chief Justice uh, when this case is decided, okay? Um, oh, there they are. They're up there. So I do have them up, okay? All right, um, in fact, this is John Marshall, he's number four, just so you're clear. Marshall is a Federalist, right? He was appointed, uh, I believe in 1800? No, maybe before that. Not appointed in 1801, right? He is appointed in 1801, and he is a Federalist. And when he gets this case, Marshall realizes that he's, he's got a bit of an issue. Right? Because if Marshall sides with Marbury, what happens? He can't get fired because he's appointed for life. No, he decides with Marbury. If he decides with his Federalist friends, would Marbury actually become a judge? Who can, who in, okay, let me ask this question. Who in 
enforces the law? The executive branch. The executive branch, yes? Right? The Supreme Court does what? They interpret the law. All right, so case goes before John Marshall. He's going to interpret the law. Let's just assume for the sake of argument he interprets this in favor of Marbury, right? Now he has made his decision. Who enforces his decision? president who has already said he's not giving this guy his job okay so here's here's what Marshall here's the issue that Marshall has yes right he can side with his buddy he can side with a federal fe fellow federalist right and then hope that Thomas Jefferson does the right thing right What's option two? He can side with Jefferson, right? What does that do to the, to the Supreme Court? It weakens the power of the Supreme Court, right? Because now they're just, well, we do whatever the president says. We don't have any actual authority, right? We just follow the president. Oh, you didn't like what the president did? Sorry, the president gets to do whatever he wants. We don't want to establish that precedent, <laughs> right? And so John Marshall is actually going to do something very intelligent, right? Marshall is going to utilize essentially legal loopholes to declare this Judiciary Act of 1801, right, as unconstitutional. And what that means is, is that what John Adams did in appointing these judges was not correct. The legal process that played out was not correct. Could Marbury get his job? Sure, if we followed the appropriate legal procedures. Who's the new president that needs to follow the appropriate legal procedures? Jefferson, is he gonna follow? No. Yes, just not for Marbury, right? Like, yeah, he, okay, fine. This is how we have to do it. The Supreme Court said this is the legal process. This is what we will do but all the ones that were done incorrectly are thrown out. And this is the Supreme Court case that creates the concept, right, or codifies the concept of judicial review, right? Marshall reviewed the law and declared the law incorrect, right? This allows him not to rule on Marbury or Jefferson slash Madison specifically, okay? this will actually increase the power of the Supreme Court, right? And Thomas Jefferson is well aware of this. Marbury kind of thinks that they won. Jefferson realizes that they lost, right? Even though they kept Marbury off the bench, they have lost because the Supreme Court has now wielded more power than what the Supreme Court was originally sort of supposed to have, right? Um, Jefferson's economic policies, these matter. Right? They matter a lot. So we know that under the Washington administration, Alexander Hamilton is, is the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, yeah? Okay. He creates the National Bank of the United States, which can regulate um, and create paper currency. Okay. And I need you to recognize this because, because this is this, but eventually you need to learn in this class, what does this work? What is what is this word? It's all mental. What, Carlos? It's all mental. Is it? Well, because it's not attached to the gold standard anymore. So then it is that we don't have a gold standard in this country. That's absolutely true, right? So what is the value of this? Well, the other one. No, that's the definition of what it is. What is the value of it? That's again the definition of what it is. Well, Tom, can I buy your hat for this? No. Okay, so the value of this is not equated to your hat. Right? Ace, can I buy your ID? No. Yeah. You'd sell me your ID for a dollar? I'm not. Why not? Because I need my ID. It costs five dollars. Okay. For 15. Yes, 15. 15 now? No, I yeah. guess. Oh, no, I think 15 is to get your cell phone back. Yeah. Right? 
I mean, here, like, 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 I want you to actually understand. Give me a phone. Give me a phone. Give me a phone. Give me a phone. Right? No, it's locked. I don't want to look at it. Right? So, right, right now, right, what is the value of this? Why is it pink? Like, $1,000? The value of this is $1,000? Well, it's too because you have it and you have to pay to get it back. Okay, so right now the value is $15, yes? Yeah. All right, so if I go turn this into admin, right, oh. it's $15. Okay? Right? Now, conversely, like, if I just looked at pay and was like, hey, just give me 10 bucks, I'll be back to you right now. Right? You know, we, we can talk about we can talk about that, but but my point, my point is trying to get you to understand the economics behind currency, yes? Okay? And interestingly enough, even because somebody said, I think it was Carlos said we're not on the gold standard anymore, yes? What is the value of gold? It's still actually the same thing, right? The difference between gold and paper currency, right, is that, that people have more faith long run in gold, right? And the reason that people have more faith in gold in the long run is because gold cannot just be created, right? Like you have to find it, you have to mine it, you have to get it out of the earth. On the other hand, if I want more of this, what do I do? Print it, right? Just print it. And Hamilton's bank can do that. It can just print, it can just create this currency, right? It provides loans to the federal government and to state banks, right? It holds government revenues and then it pays government bills. So that means when taxes come in, where does that money go? It goes to Hamilton's bank, right? When the government needs to pay its bills, it goes to Hamilton's bank, all right? Okay, Jefferson, again, is a fiscal hawk. He does not like all of this, okay? But a number of people are going to grow that the bank is going to grow on them, right? To where we get to this idea that it is sort of essential for economic growth, right? That Hamilton's ideology is correct because without the bank actually performing these functions, right, you cannot grow economically. All right? This will be the last thing that we that we we cover today, right? During the Jefferson administration. Thomas Jefferson is going to, one of the issues Thomas Jefferson deals with is the city of New Orleans and the Mississippi River, right? And I think we've talked about this a little bit. We've hinted at this, yes. We know that right now the boundary of the United States is the Mississippi River, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Who controls the Mississippi River? So the Spanish were at one point in time. The French have re reacquired it. The French control New Orleans. Now, I need you to realize something, right? The, the Mississippi River exits right here in New Orleans, okay? If up in Tennessee, if we own Memphis, right, and they own West Memphis, Arkansas, or whatever it's called, right, who controls the actual Mississippi River? They share. So theoretically, it would be shared by both entities, yes? Okay, but the reality is whoever controls New Orleans controls it because that's where you got to get out. Okay, we'll finish tomorrow.